Okay, so this is modeling part one. And so the module objectives for this, this morning we will be going over multiple linear regression, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, so it's kind of just to ease us into things before we get into generalized linear modeling in R. Um, so for each of these types of models, we'll be going over how to evaluate the fit of the model and model diagnostics. And then also just how to select an appropriate model, including um, choosing your relevant covariates. And then we'll also get into a little bit of model visualization. So again, this is our massive decision tree. Like we were saying yesterday, these aren't even all the exhaustive options uh, available to you, but we're kind of hoping that you can use this as a guide. Um, so kind of difficult to see, but if you have it open in your browser, you can follow along. Um, today, we will be going down this kind of estimation understanding route all the way towards linear modeling. So in the linear modeling, basically we broke it down into, you have your different kinds of outcomes. So in our standard linear regression model, for instance, that would be a continuous or more normally distributed outcome. Um, but oftentimes you might have things like abundance data where it's more of a count outcome um, or like a binary, like alive or dead, for example. Um, so it's important to know how to deal with all these different kinds of outcomes. And that's what we'll be discussing today. So there's kind of two main purposes of why we would conduct a linear regression model. Um, one route that you can take with it is prediction. So if we were to fit our model on some training data, then we can use that model to predict uh, responses for previously unseen data. Um, so Patrick will kind of be going over a little bit more of that today, but for now we are gonna be focused more on like the estimation and actually understanding how your variables are related. So I'm sure a lot of you already know this, but just to review some definitions to make sure that everybody's on the same page, um, because I will be flipping back and forth a lot between the different names for things. So for instance, we have the predictor variables, and those are used to explain or predict changes in your outcome. Um, and so predictor, you might hear me call it an independent variable, a covariate, an explanatory variable, or a predictor. Uh, for responses, those are what we are trying to predict or explain. So the names are dependent variable, outcome, target, and response. And then we also have confounders. Um, so these are also known as moderating variables in some disciplines, and they would be associated with both the predictor and the response. And so without accounting for them in our regression model, we might see a spurious correlation between the predictor of interest and response if we do not account for these. So going over the basic linear regression model, um, I'm sure all of you have seen this in your intro stats course, but we have our simple linear regression model, which just means we have a single predictor variable. So we'll call that X1. And so you can see here that we have our beta naught would be our intercept variable, which tells us the estimated value of Y when X is zero. And then we have beta one, which we can interpret as the change or the estimated change in Y when we increase X by one unit. Then we have the multiple linear regression. So we can add in extra variables. So that now instead of just a single predictor, we'll have X one to XP and each of those has their own corresponding coefficient. So there's some important assumptions that we have to make to conduct a linear regression model. And so that's what we're gonna be heavily focused on today is checking these assumptions. So the first one would be the linearity assumption. So that is gonna be the assumption that the relationship between your predictors and your response is a linear relationship. Um, so that means that you don't see any like curves to it, um, or sometimes you might need to apply a transformation to your variable if it, is very skewed, for instance. Um, another assumption would be independence. So this one is a bit harder to check with your data. It's more based on how the data was collected. So you kind of just have to think critically about the design. Um, but our standard linear regression models are gonna be assuming that the observations are independent of one another. And so basically we just can't have the case where, um, for instance, you're having repeat observations. And then we have homoscedasticity, which just means constant variance of your model residuals across the predicted values. Normality is that the model residuals follow the normal distribution. 
And then we have uh, no multicollinearity. So that just means that your predictors cannot be highly correlated with one another. Otherwise, it's just kind of difficult for the model to disentangle where the true relationship lies. So just to take a bit of a closer look at each of these, we have the linearity assumption. So this uh, plot on the top here would show a linear relationship between our predictor X and our outcome Y. Whereas the plot on the bottom, you can kind of see that looks like there might be more of a curved relationship there. Um, so if you saw something like that when you're plotting X versus Y before fitting your model, then perhaps you would add a um, polynomial term for your covariate, such as X squared, um, to try and see if that kind of improves your model fit. Then we have the independence assumption. So again, this is just going to be based on your data collection methods. Um, so you just have to review how the data was collected to ensure that the observations are independent. So that just means no repeating subjects, no family members, um, things like that. There are models that we can use to account for this if you do have repeating subjects over time, for instance, uh, but those are out of the scope for this um, course. And if your assumption is not met, um, then you just cannot use regular linear regression. And then we have the constant variance assumption. So this one will be checking after the model is fit. So with the model residuals and its fitted or predicted values, we can plot the residuals on the y-axis and our fitted values on the x-axis. We ideally would want to see something like the plot on the right here, where you can see that the residuals are randomly scattered. Um, there's no clear pattern to them, and they're randomly scattered around zero in particular. Whereas the plot on the left, we can see a very clear pattern to those residuals. Um, as they're decreasing with fitted values and the overall variability of those residuals just does not seem constant. Um, so if this is not met, then we can try adding variables or transforming variables because it could just mean that we are missing important information in our model. Um, or you can also think more critically about your outcome and think whether a generalized linear model might make more sense rather than a standard linear regression. Again, we have the normality assumption. Um, so this one is also important and we have to check it based on the model residuals after fitting the model. So we can do this uh, most commonly with a QQ plot where basically it will plot this red line for you and we just wanna see the points follow along that red diagonal line. Um, so again, the plot on the right would show that the data is mostly following along that red line. So we would say that it's normally distributed Whereas the plot on the left, you can see that it kind of starts to skew upwards towards the end, um, which means that a transformation might be required, um, or we might need to add more variables, polynomial terms, et cetera. So we can kind of play around with that. Then we have the multicollinearity assumption. So again, we just are going to assume that uh, the predictors that we are including are not highly correlated with one another. Um, so one way that we can kind of adjust for this is just to look at the correlation matrices prior to fitting the regression um, and then just look for very high correlation values like above 0.8, for example. Um, or we can use variance inflation factors after fitting the linear model. So the variance inflation factor will measure how much variance of regression coefficient is inflated due to inclusion of other variables in the model. So basically it will try and predict that variable given the other variables in the model. And if it can do too good of a job, um, then that means that we have some high multicollinearity. So I will show you a function that can calculate these variance inflation factors for you. And then we kind of have our rough guidelines that if they are greater than five for a variable, then that's somewhat concerning. Um, and if they're greater than 10, then that's very concerning. Um, there's high multicollinearity in that model. So if that is the case, um, then we can remove one of the variables of concern or both, um, or we can conduct elastic net, which will shrink the variables to zero together rather than randomly setting one to zero. Um, so Patrick will kind of review that later on today as well. And then for determining which variables to include, there's kind of two streams. Um, so we can really think about like what theoretically makes sense. So you can do a literature review. Um, I'm sure you're all experts in your area anyway, so you probably also know what variables make sense to include, what is of interest to the broader population. Um, and then beyond that, we can just see based on statistical evidence what we should be including. So you can do some plotting beforehand to see whether there are variables 
that are potential confounders if they are related to some predictors of interest and the outcome, because um, then we might want to account for them in the model, or just whether we need to consider transformations of the variables. And also after we fit a regression model, then we can compare that to a simpler model that isn't including all of the variables um, to see if the model that is more simple can still adequately explain our data. So overall, the goal is typically to find the most parsimonious model that adequately explains the data, uh, because theoretically we could just keep on adding <laughs> um, predictors to the model to get a better and better fit. Uh, but that is not always the most practical method due to the sample size, but also just the fact that that's going to be picking up a lot of noise. So we do want a pretty parsimonious model in the end. So comparing nested models, so when I say nested, I just mean that basically the one model is like a subset of the other. So in this example on the left here, we can see that if we have the variables x1 to x4, then our reduced model will just set some of those to zero or remove them from the model, in other words. So we would just leave in x2 and x4, uh, but you can see that's just a subset of our full model. And so in R, there is a function, the ANOVA function can be used to compare nested models, where our null hypothesis is going to be that the reduced model adequately explains the data and that and then the alternative is that the full model is necessary. Um, and so we can fit the full model first uh, with all the variables of interest. So this would be x1 to x4. Then we can fit a second model, which will exclude some of the variables. Um, so we're going to call that red for reduced. And then we'll use the ANOVA function, um, which will compare that reduced model to the full model. And then based on the p-value, we can determine whether we can remove those extra variables from the model or not. So we'll go over that a bit as well. Then interpreting the output, um, I'm sure you've all seen this before, but just to briefly review, so this would be the linear model output on our right-hand side here. Um, and so we can see that, for instance, if we were predicting respiratory rate based on heart rate and blood pressure, um, then it will come out with the intercept row, which will give us the estimate, standard error, and test um, t-test for our beta naught, which is just going to be the estimated mean of our response when all the covariates are zero. Then we have our slopes. So beta 1 to beta p are going to be um, just called whatever their covariate is called. So for instance, beta 1 in this case will be the HR row, so we'll have 0.48 as our estimate for beta one, and then 0 0.135 as our estimate for beta two. And so that's kind of how you can read that um, linear model output. Other things that you might want to pay attention to are things like the multiple R squared down here, because that will give us how much of the variability is actually being explained um, from the covariates included in the model. And then we have uh, interaction effects. So an interaction effect um, would be looking at whether one variable moderates the relationship of another, um, or in other words, we're looking at whether the effect of a variable will depend on the level of another variable and vice versa. So for example, um, if we're looking at something like the effect of a treatment on some outcome, um, then we might be interested in looking whether there's an interaction for sex, just because we would want to know something like if the treatment is successful in reducing symptoms for women and non-effective in men, then that would mean that we have an interaction effect with sex. So our linear regression model is going to look like this equation here when we have that interaction. So all the interaction is doing is simply multiplying the two covariates of interest together. So let's say x1 is sex and x2 is our treatment, then x1 times x2 is going to be our interaction. And we can get a better understanding about interpreting these coefficients uh, by stratifying this linear regression. So when we have an indicator variable such as sex and treatment, um, so again, let's say x1 is sex such that it's equal to one if the individual is male and zero if the individual is female. And then we have x2 is for whether the individual is treated, which would be equal to one or untreated, zero. Um, then what we can do is we can kind of plug in some values to get the linear regression model for males and the linear regression for females and then compare them. 
So for the first option for males, because we know that X1 is equal to one, if the individual is a male, then wherever we see an X1 in our linear model, we're just going to plug in a one. So we'll now have Y hat is equal to beta naught plus beta one plus beta two X2 plus beta three times X2. So then we can kind of group those together. Um, so you can see that beta one can be joined in with our intercept and that beta three can be joined in with beta two, just based on um, grouping like terms. And then for females, instead of subbing in a one for X1, we're gonna sub in a zero. And then we're left with beta naught plus beta two X2. And so then for, um, so then what we end up with is we can then compare the intercepts and the slopes of these two stratified models. So for instance, for males, we have that the intercept is beta naught plus beta one. Whereas for females, we have that the intercept is beta naught. So then that means that in our regression model, we can interpret beta one as the change in intercept for males compared to females or the change in the expected mean. Whereas you can see that for our slope of X2, which was our treatment variable, for males, the new slope is beta two plus beta three. And then for females, the slope is just beta two. So then that means that we can interpret beta three as the change in slope due to treatment um, for males compared to females. And then in the end, we can visualize an interaction as well. So we'll go over this a little bit with ggplot. Uh, but let's say that we're looking at the treatment effect again along the x-axis here. So anytime that we have an interaction, you'll kind of expect to see lines that are not parallel, basically is all that means, because they'll have different slopes. Um, and so we can see here that for males, which is the blue line, um, the treatment group will have higher severity of symptoms than the untreated, whereas for females, we see the opposite effect. And so that would be the interaction effect. And then we can use the comparing nested models um, in order to see whether we actually need to include the interaction or whether we can just include the main effects alone. So if we were to include the interaction, then we'll end up with a different intercept and different slope model, which will be the top plot here. So you can see that the blue and red line will have separate intercepts. Um, and then also they both clearly have different slopes as well across our X value. Whereas if we just were to include the main effect, then we're gonna be assuming that there is no interaction. So for group A and group B, we're gonna see the same slope, but because we're including the main effects, we're gonna just see a different intercept for those two. And then if we don't need to include the grouping effect at all, then we'll have the same intercept, same slope model, which just means that group isn't in our model at all. So we're gonna see that across X, we're gonna have the same exact line for group A and group B. Um, so in this example here, you can see that clearly we would need different intercepts and different slopes to adequately explain that data. So that was a lot probably, but um, we're going to jump into the module three lab. 